Hello and welcome to lecture 10 of our introduction to machine learning course. Today we're going to talk about PCA, the principal component analysis. And let me start with the, with the same reminder as I did last time. So we spent a lot of time talking about supervised learning where we have some input data X and we have some output data Y and the task is to learn the mapping between the X and the Y, so that's prediction problems. And then we started to talk about unsupervised learning where we don't have any Y. So we are not predicting anything, we just have some data, um, the matrix X, and we try to learn some, some structure that's present, um, that's present in the data. So this is not a prediction problem anymore, this is the exploration uh, problem, if you will. So last time, last week, we talked about clustering. So in clustering, we want to we want to split the rows of X that correspond to samples in the data set. So as a reminder, these are samples and these are my features. So we're splitting the samples into several groups and we say this is cluster one, this is cluster two, this is cluster three, for example, if we, if we want to cluster into, into three clusters and that's the output of our clustering algorithm. Today we're going to talk about a different thing, dimensionality reduction, which operates on the, on the features, on the columns of the X matrix. So we want to reduce the number of columns in X. We usually don't want to just pick some features that are present here and discard the others, but we want to somehow treat all these features together and just reduce their number, let's say we had a thousand features in the data set and we just want to keep 10. So we want to transform the existing thousand features and produce 10 new features and these are the features that we want to use later on. So this is um, what we're going to understand by dimensionality reduction, reduce the dimensionality of the data. But importantly, we're not just selecting features here, we're transforming them. So why would we want to do that? And I think there's two, very broadly, there's two reasons one, why, why one may want to do something like that. So one reason is to explore the data, to obtain some insight into the structure of the data. So after you obtain this reduced number of features, you somehow want to inspect them. You want to look at these new features and learn, hopefully learn something about your data. A different reason is to do that as a pre-processing step. So maybe you reduce the number of features from 1,000 to 10, and then you put this new smaller data set with only 10 features into some other algorithm, perhaps to predict something else, perhaps into supervised learning algorithm. Um, and there may be different reasons for, for wanting to do that. So we're going to talk about both uh, reasons today uh, and um, as applied to principal component analysis. So PCA can be used for both, uh, for both goals. All right, so in principal components, so let, 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 me, let me start as always, or as almost always, by, by talking about some toy data. So here is a two-dimensional data set, feature one and feature two, they are correlated, these are my samples, and in this very toy setting, very simple setting, I'm going to reduce the number of features from two down to one, right? Um, this is a linear method, PCA is a linear method, which means that we are transforming our data X into X times some vector W, which means we're just projecting all the samples onto a, a, a new axis. So again, we're not just picking one of the existing axes, we're projecting it on a new axis. So let me try to illustrate it with a, with a ruler. So this is going to be my new axis, and it can be anything, so let's say I'm putting this axis like that, this is my new axis, and then each point is going to get just projected on that, like that, orthogonally, right? And then we look at the coordinate that you obtain on this new axis here, and then you imagine that you basically take this one-dimensional data outside here, you forget about the original data, and now you have the positions of your point here on this ruler in one dimension, and that's your new data set, okay? So you reduce dimensionality by projecting everything to one dimension. The question is, how do you choose the dimension? So you can project like that, like that, like that, right? So you can imagine this thing rotating and this is the freedom that you have. You can may maybe you also can just project everything on the horizontal axis or on the vertical axis or on some kind of diagonal axis. So what axis would you choose here if you only are allowed to, um, to have one one axis here. Is there like in some sense a special axis here? Maybe you can already guess from the from the shape of this 
of this scatter plot, what would be what would you choose um, as the best axis? I didn't define what best means so far, right? So I I, I want you to also just consider this uh, the scatter plot and think a little bit in your heads about what this may be. Um, so one remark is that when we define the problem like that, then it's enough to consider only unit vectors. So the vectors that have unit length um, and they define, right, the, any axis can be defined by a unit vector pointing in the direction of this axis. Okay, so here is one particular axis drawn with the, with the, with the linear projection. How would we how would we choose an axis? So, in fact, I can give you several, several possible loss functions, several possible criteria by which, um, by which to choose an axis. In particular, I will give you two. So one is you may want to minimize the reconstruction error. So by reconstruction error, I mean these, these distances here, distance between the original point and the projection on this one-dimensional subspace. Okay? So these are all these this, this lengths here, sometimes they're larger, sometimes they're smaller. So imagine you sum this all up, the squared distances across the entire data set, and this is your squared reconstruction uh, error. And it makes sense that we may want to minimize that. We want to somehow preserve as much information as possible about the original data in our new reduced data. Okay, that makes sense. Here's a completely different criterion we may want to maximize the variance. And this means we projected the data on one dimension. Now we just have these points and nothing else. Or imagine that you only have these coordinates and nothing else, and ju you compute the variance of these points. And that's it. You compute the variance, and you want to maximize this variance. So why would you want to do that? Because um, intuitively, if you, if you, if you had some, some variation in your original raw data, then you projected everything to some, to some dimension, and the variance is very small, of the resulting data, then maybe you lost kind of a lot of useful variation that was present there originally. So you want to find some projection where the data is spread, spread out. You're hoping that when the data are spread out, then this means that you're also preserving some useful uh, structure. That's not guaranteed, but that's the hope. And by the way, this can be set up in any dimensions, right? So you can have 10 original dimensions and you still be looking for one axis so you can project everything on one dimension, even starting from 10 dimensions, doesn't have to be two. Obviously, you project everything to one dimension and then you either want to minimize the reconstruction error or you want to maximize the variance of the projection. Now, the amazing thing is that this is actually the same objective. These things are equivalent and principal component analysis does both. So you can introduce principal component analysis by like that or you can introduce it like that. These are equivalent things. Uh, let me prove that. That's actually pretty easy to see. I, I said it's amazing because the first time you see these things defined, they don't look very similar, but once you think a little bit about that, it's actually pretty pretty clear. So here is here is my two-dimensional data, and I'm just focusing on one point here. Here, This is xi. Consider this one sample, and this is the axis. Let's say my axis is now fixed, and I'm projecting it here. So this ei is, is, is my reconstruction error and this di is the new coordinate of the point in this new uh, in af after the projection right and by uh, like obviously by pythagoras theorem this squared length plus this squared length equals the the norm the squared length of my original vector which means that i can rotate the axis as i want but the di squared plus ei squared would, will always be equal to this which does not depend on the axis that's just some constant so that's neat. We can sum this up um, over the entire data set um, and divide by the number of samples. And then what we have here on the right side is just a constant. It depends on the data set, but doesn't depend on the chosen axis. What we have here is the reconstruction error, the sum of the squared errors. And what we have here is the sum of squared deviations from zero. But let's assume here for the moment that all features are centered. right? So we subtracted the mean in advance and then this is the same as the sum of squared deviations from the mean which is variance by definition so what we have here is that for centered data variance plus mean squared error uh, or mean squared reconstruction error equals some constant so if this goes up this goes down which means whenever this is the smallest this is the largest end of 
proof, right? That's what we wanted to show. So we can want to, we can decide we will to, to minimize this, th this term, or we can say we will maximize this term. These are, this is actually the same thing. Okay, so that's, that's, that's neat. One comment here is that whenever I say minimize the squared error, you may think of linear regression, right? So the in, in linear regression, um, we are also minimizing the, the prediction, the squared, the squared error across the data set. So this may seem similar, but this is a very different thing. Let me try to illustrate this here so that there's no confusion. This is my illustration of PCA, the same picture as before, right? We have two features and, um, well, some line like that will probably make these, these, uh, these errors small, right? So this may be, something like that may be the solution to the, to the PCA problem. Uh, but I can say that I'm predicting this feature from that feature. So I will call this Y and I will call that X and then I can consider a regression problem where the difference is that it's also the loss function here is also the sum of the square distances, but these are squared errors between my prediction and the corresponding actual y. So all these lines are parallel to the y-axis, right? That's how that's how we defined regression in one of the first lectures. Um, whereas here, all these lines are perpendicular to the axis; they are not parallel to any of the uh, any of the axis, and this makes a big difference. This, this makes these problems not equivalent. Um, this is not symmetric, right? So this treats these two features differently because we, we think that my x is fixed and I'm just trying to predict y. So my errors uh, go like that. And here it's symmetric. The x, x1 and x2 are on the same footing here. I'm not trying to predict anything. Um, and in fact, they may have or they will usually have very different solutions. So this may not be super obvious from this plot that I drew here. So I try to make it clearer um, with this example where I consider the data set that is almost spherical, but it's just a little bit stretched in the diagonal direction, but only, only a little, okay? So the data basically is formed like that. It's almost, it's almost spherical, it's a little stretched. And if you think about minimizing these errors, then it's clear that as soon as it's just a tiny bit stretched in that direction, this will be the axis that minimizes these errors, basically by the symmetry, it's, it's pretty obvious. Whereas here it's not the case. So this is a bad regression solution because here you have a lot of points with large error below the line and here you have a lot of points with large error above the line. So actually your, this, the regression loss will decrease if you rotate this axis towards the, the horizontal axis. And if, if you think what happens if you start with spherical spherical distribution, just gradually stretch it like that, then the regression line will start horizontally and then will slowly rotate like that because the regression solution is actually a continuous function of the input data. If you think, remember what, what was the formula for beta hat, um, transforming the x data a little bit will just transform the beta hat a little bit. Um, and this consideration, by the way, immediately tells you that for PCA, this is not the case. So in PCA, you can change the data a tiny little bit and the solution of the of the PCA problem will will just jump elsewhere, so it's not it's not a continuous formula. But we will see this later on. Okay, so not equivalent problems. All right, we're talking about reconstruction error, but that's a different error. Good. Now let's try to define this mathematically. So what is then the the loss function? We'll try to define it in formulas, and then we will try to solve it. So here is minimizing the reconstruction error. So this is the squared norm. Uh, of what? So I have my original data x and then I have my projection. So I have, I take my x data, I project it on some w, which is just a unit vector defining the axis, right? So these are my projections, but this xw is now a one-dimensional object and I need to somehow compare it to the original two or higher dimensions. So how to do that? Well, think about think about this scatter plot on the, on the previous slides. You're projecting these points, then so I had some points and I'm projecting somewhere What's the coordinate, the two-dimensional coordinate of this point is the w, the unit vector along this axis, times the coordinate after projection. So xw gives you the coordinate after projection, then I multiply it by w again to put this on this axis back, and now I can subtract, and, and these are my errors, and this, this Frobenius norm sums, as we discussed before, over the, over the entire data set. So this is my... Um, 
average or summed reconstruction error across all samples. By the way, this WWT that appears here, uh, we can call th this is mathematically known as, as a projection operator because what this WWT does is takes the X and projects on the one dimensional subspace. But still keeping both dimensions, you know, so it's, it's this together is vectors in two dimensions, but all of them lying on, 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 one, on one dimension. Okay, so now we have a loss. That's the loss function. But let, let, let us consider this maximizing variance objective also. So now we project everything. W w X, W are my new coordinates. And as we agreed, X has all features centered. All right. So if I want to compute the variance, I'm just taking the squared, um, squared uh, values and, and sum them up. So that's a scalar product of this vector with itself. So here it is transposed times itself divided by the number of samples. And now what we have here is X transpose X over N, which is the sample covariance matrix of my data. So I can rewrite it like that. Uh, here is my covariance matrix of the data. Gets multiplied by the W on the right and on the left. The resulting thing is just one number, which is the variance of my projection, right? This is subject to W being a unit vector having a unit length otherwise it doesn't make sense to ask to maximize this because i i can take w very long and this will just increase the value of this of this product so this is this is uh, it can go to infinity this doesn't make sense so we say w has to lie on a circle or on a one dimensional sphere in higher dimensions and under this constraint we want to maximize this object. C is given, right? That's the covariance matrix of the data. So we have the matrix C and we want to maximize that subject to this constraint. So this is equivalent to this. I proved it for you just with a simple proof using Pythagoras theorem. One can write it down algebraically and see that it's the same here, but it will be the same proof. Just, um, just put down in, in these formulas. Okay, so now, now we want to solve it. How do we solve it? So we want to maximize this, uh, this term in the title of this slide under the constraint that W has unit length, right? So to solve a problem under a constraint, we can use the Lagrange multipliers that we discussed briefly before when we talked about uh, what? About ridge regression, I believe, um, back in lecture four. So in this case, it's actually very simple. So we have this, this thing, right, that we want to to maximize, I'll put the minus here so that we're minimizing it. And then we have the constraint that W transpose W equals to one. So we put this Lagrange multiplier in front and that's what we want to minimize now. That's how Lagrange multipliers work. So we're setting this to zero, the partial derivative with respect to W, which is in this case, everything is quadratic. So it's very simple derivative of that. It's just CW actually times two. And on the right you have lambda W times two. So I, I um, already, erase the twos and there is just plus lambda which doesn't contribute anything so we get this so whenever we are at a at a maximum or minimum of this function this holds so this is a curious curious equation it means that we the w our unit vector w has to have a particular property M when multiplied by the matrix it just gets scaled so usually when you have a vector and you have a square matrix, right? So C is a square matrix. Um, let's say in 10 dimensions. So you have a vector in 10 dimensions. Usually when you have some vector and some matrix and this matrix acts on this vector like that, you multiply it, it, it rotates somewhere and, and also changes the length. But it will not point in the same direction after multiplication. But sometimes you may have the situation that you multiply it by the matrix and it just gets scaled, right? It's the basically the vector stays the same, just, just stretches, but it doesn't get rotated. Um, so this, this object then has a name. This is called an eigenvector of matrix C. Okay, so by definition, whenever this holds true, W is an eigenvector of, the, of, of matrix C with lambda being an eigenvalue of this corresponding eigenvector. Okay, so this means that, so a matrix can have, can have several um, eigenvectors. But what we proved here is that if we want to maximize the variance, then we should take one of the eigenvectors as the solution. So which one we should take? Well, 
the variance will be just given by WCW, which is W lambda W, but W, w, w times W is 1, so the variance will be just given by lambda. So the eigenvalue actually gives you the, the resulting variance. So if you want the maximum variance, you have to take the largest eigenvalue, right? So here is the solution. We, 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 we solved it. We need to take the eigenvector of the covariance matrix with the largest eigenvalue. Um, well, we solved it in a sense that we just we just said that you need to find this eigenvector, right? So the question is how to find the eigenvector, and that's something that uh, for which you need to use um, like you, you usually. So it's complicated problem that you can't do by hand. You need to you need to run um, standard um, implementations existing in any programming language that will give you the eigenvectors of a square matrix. So we're not. It's not a numerical um, numerical optimization course. We're not going to discuss how the program actually finds the eigenvector, uh, which is actually another interesting question, but not for today. Um, let's say we have a routine that gives you eigenvectors of any given matrix C. If you have that, you just take the one with the largest eigenvalue, and that's your principal component number one. Okay, um, I want to um, spend five minutes now talking about uh, a bit about eigenvectors and eigenvalues of covariance matrices in more generally. So in our case, we're talking about covariance matrix, right? Covariance matrix is a symmetric square matrix with all real entries. Um, one can prove, I won't prove that, but one can prove that any matrix like that has P eigenvectors. So if it's, if it's in 10 dimensions, it will have 10, at least 10, it can have more, but it will have at least 10 eigenvectors and you can choose these 10 eigenvectors such that they are all orthogonal to each other. So in fact, this, this, this second part is easy to prove. You can, quite, you can very easily prove that if, in, if you have two eigenvectors with different eigenvalues, then they have to be orthogonal. That's an exercise for you. Um, and let's, let's just um, uh, take my word that you can find P of them. Okay. One thing that I do want to prove is that if you have two eigenvectors, W1 and W2, so they are, and if they are orthogonal, right? So this, as I said, um, uh, above. So let's say you take two eigenvectors that are orthogonal to each other, then um, also this term is zero. So this is immediately follows from from the above, right? Because the CW2, that's an eigenvector, just scales W2. And then you have lambda over here, you can take it out of this, and then you have W1 transpose W2, which is zero. So if you have two eigenvectors and they are orthogonal, then you can plug the covariance matrix in the middle and the product will still be zero, which means that after projecting your data on W1 and on W2, the covariance between the projections will be zero, which means the correlation will also be zero. So imp very important, the correlation of your data after you projected the data on two different eigenvectors of the uh, two different orthogonal eigenvectors of the covariance matrix, the correlation will be zero. So this is actually pretty neat. Um, I will um, I will show you why in a second, but let conti let's continue with the math a little bit. So this actually implies that if you if you rotate your entire coordinate axis such that every basis vector is the eigenvector, so you rotate, you, you rotate your coordinate system into the eigenvector basis, then the covariance matrix will become diagonal like that. It will have zeros everywhere um, and only lambdas on the diagonal. So let me, let me um, walk you through this. So X is my data. Let's say I take all eigenvectors of C and stack them as columns in, in a matrix and call it V. Then you multiply x by v to get your rotated data. So this is actually an orthogonal matrix. V is an orthogonal matrix, so it just does rotation of the coordinate frame. So this is your new rotated data. Okay, and if we compute the covariance matrix of this new rotated data, right, so which is this data transpose times itself, then here in the middle you get C and you get... These are all eigenvectors, so by this property, whenever this term is off diagonal and these are two different eigenvectors from here you get zeros so you get a matrix here that is diagonal i call it lambda 
and has eigenvalues on the diagonal and zeros everywhere else, which means I can also rewrite, multiply by V and V transpose on the left and on the right, and write my original covariance matrix like that. So we can take any square symmetric uh, matrix, any covariance matrix, and, um, and, and then decompose it like that. That's called an eigen decomposition. It has P eigenvectors corresponding eigenvalues, and one can rewrite it like that. Um, so let's step back a little bit after this math and just consider what we learned again. So here is my scatter plot mm, that I used in the beginning of the lecture, right? And we're choosing, we're talking about uh, choosing here the best projection axis. So in fact, there's, I can give you a third, a third way to think about choosing the best axis here. So we can either maximize the variance of the projection, and look here the variance is really small, right? If you project everything here, but here it's larger, 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 and then somewhere here the variance will be really large, as measured by my ruler. Then I can re want to minimize the reconstruction error, and here the reconstruction errors are as small as they can be. So this is equivalent, we proved that. And the third way to think about that as is to also think about the second orthogonal axis that is rotated together here, and in this position, there is no correlation between the projection on the ruler axis and the projection um, on, on this orthogonal axis, right? So if you turn your head like that and look at the scatter plot, then it becomes uncorrelated. There's in the original data, there's correlation. With I in any other position, there's still correlation. There's one position where the correlation is zero, and that's the same axis that maximizes the variance and minimizes the error. That's the eigenvector. So that's the first eigenvector with the largest eigenvalue of this covariance matrix, and orthogonal to it is the second eigenvector, um, with, in this case, the smallest eigenvalue. There are only two. They are orthogonal, these eigenvectors, and the projections on this are have correlation zero. So if you think about these in 10 dimensions, then you will have 10 um, eigenvectors that are all orthogonal and, and projections on them are all uncorrelated. Okay. I always was talking about choosing the first axis, so I defined the loss function for, for choosing the first axis that maximizes the variance, minimizes the error, but actually it works in a, in a greedy fashion. You can find, you can def similarly define subsequent principal components, principal component axis and they will turn out to be just subsequent eigenvectors. So the first eigenvector defines you the direction of the first principal component. The second eigenvector defines you the direction of the second principal component, which has the maximum variance uh, under the constraint of being orthogonal to the first one, and so on and so forth. So once you did the eigen decomposition of the covariance matrix, you have all principal axes already in there. That all eigenvectors give you the principal axis of your data. So in some sense, sometimes you can, you can hear saying, people saying that PCA is just rotation. So PCA just takes your original data, rotates such that all correlations now are set to zero. That's, that's equivalent uh, view of the principal component. Analysis. Okay, one last remark, and then we will proceed to some examples, um, is the relationship of these two singular value decomposition, so you might have noticed that this is pretty similar to what we discussed before um, for SVD. So we talked in, in several lectures already that you can take your data X and decompose like that, where this is left singular vectors, these are right singular vectors, they are all orthogonal to each other, and S is a diagonal matrix with singular values. Okay, And now we can, we can compute the covariance matrix, which is X transpose X, plug this in here, U transpose U falls out because this is this is identity matrix, and what you're left with is this. This is some uh, S squared is a diagonal matrix. We can call it lambda, and then uh, so if you first do SVD of X, then the covariant corresponding covariance matrix has this form, which is the same form as as I said, as the eigen decomposition. Just uh, two slides 
two slides uh, back, right? So these are eigenvectors of my covariance matrix, and these are eigenvalues, which means immediately that eigenvectors of the covariance matrix is the same thing as the right singular vectors of my data matrix. And the eigenvalues of the covariance matrix are a squared singular values divided by the sample size. So in fact, eigen decomposition, singular value decomposition are very, very similar things. Um, and you can obtain the eigen decomposition of the covariance matrix by doing SVT um, of the original data matrix. All of that holds, important remark, just a reminder, if X is centered, which means all features all features have mean zero. Why? Because if, if, if that's not the case, then this is not the covariance matrix. The covariance matrix is like the covariance between two features is the sum of squared deviations, um, sum of like product of, of, of deviations from the mean, right? So we have to subtract the mean here before multiplying, but if the mean is zero, there's nothing to subtract, and then we can write it like that. So it's, it's as always, as was the case in the regression problems, it's very convenient to, to first center the, um, the X matrix. Okay. As I said in the beginning, one can do PCA for two reasons, or maybe there's more, but that's two reasons that, that I usually encounter. Either you want to explore the data, or you want to pre-process the data. So let's consider these two goals now, and how would PCA help us? So here, we, we'll start with data exploration. And here is one, um, one uh, figure that I particularly like here. This is a, data s this is a very small um, and simple, in a way, data set. Um, where the samples are wines, these are Italian wines, so every, every dot here is one particular wine, and uh, each wine was measured with respect to like, something like 10 different features. So the features can be the alcohol content of the wine, and uh, the concentration, concentrations um, of, 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 of different things in, in the wine, and I, I see color here, so it was somehow color was coded numerically, right? And then you me I think these are all red wines, but still the hue of the red color can differ a little bit. So you measure every wine with these 10 characteristics, or uh, around 10, and that's your, that's your X matrix data. So and then you can do PCA on that, and then you can, plot. so usually when you see PCA results plotted, then it's usually two dimensions. So you don't just plot things in one dimension, you find principal component number one and principal component number two, which corresponds to not uh, finding the best one-dimensional projection, but looking at a best two-dimensional projection, right? So where is the plane in in my original ten-dimensional space such that I project everything on my plane, and it has like the highest variance and so on? So this is this plane principle PC one, PC two on the vertical axis. So if you look at only the points so far, ignore the arrows, then. From the colors it's of the points, it's clear that there is quite some structure captured here. So what are the colors? These are two, uh, these are three um, wine uh, grapes and varieties of the grapes, right? And, and they are neatly separated here. So you have one variety here, another here, and another here, and they almost don't overlap, but PCA didn't know about that, right? It just, it just found the plane with the most variance, but actually it turns out that if you know that these are three different grape varieties, then of course you would want this to be to be also visible on this two-dimensional projection, and it is, even though that was an unsupervised problem uh, that didn't know about the, ab about the varieties. And in fact, if you didn't know about the varieties, just plotted all of that in black, then you would maybe also see some structure in here. Uh, perhaps you wouldn't see three clusters, but maybe you would see that there is like seems to be a one-dimensional structure. Um, okay, so that's that's the points. And the second ni second nice thing here is the is the original features. So one can one can um, one can make a plot like that. It's called a biplot, where you plot the projection, the, the points, but you then you also for each original feature find the correlation of this feature with the principal component one and with the principal component two, and plot an arrow that um, has as coordinates 
these two correlations. Okay, so if something is correlated to PC1 strongly, you will see a large arrow pointing to the right or to the left. And if something is correlated strongly with principal component 2, it will point upwards. So by looking at these arrows, uh, focusing on the large ones, on the long longest ones, you can see which original features basically drive principal component 1 and principal component 2 in particular. So this may help you to interpret the PC1 and PC2. So often in this exploration case, you would maybe want to understand, well, here's my principal component 1. That's the largest mode of variation in my data. And it is actually associated with like ph phenol um, uh, levels in my wines. Right? So um, th this kind of plot can be helpful. OK. Um, one thing that I didn't explain about this plot, see, it says 37% explain variance here and 19% uh, explain variance uh, at PC2. So what does that mean? So let me, let me um, explain this bit. Um, a very important object here is the sum of all eigenvalues. So after you transformed your, your covariance matrix into diagonal shape, you can sum all diagonal values and this is called a trace of the covariance matrix. Um, the trace of the covariance matrix is the sum of the, or the trace of any matrix is the sum of diagonal elements. And the nice thing about the trace is that if you rotate your coordinate frame, the trace doesn't change. So the sum of the eigenvalues is the same thing as the sum of my original variances because that was the trace before I did the PCA. I had my covariance matrix C, right? It had some values off diagonal, it had some values on the diagonal. On the diagonal, you have the variances of your features. If you sum them all up, only along the diagonal, you get this, the sum of the variances. And by this property of the trace, that's the same of the sum of the eigenvalues. Actually, it's easy to see if you know how to work with traces. So the trace of, of my original covariance matrix, which can be written down like that, under the trace, one can, that's the property of a trace that I'm using here, one can uh, one can, so if you have three matrices, a product of three matrices under trace, you can take this one and move in the front and the trace won't change. I won't prove it, just an algebra fact. And then you, 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 bring, uh, you bring V transpose here. This is the identity matrix and you have just a trace of lambda. So this is very useful. This means that you started with some features that had some variances and then you did the PCA and the sum of eigenvalues is is the same as the sum of your original variances. We order the principal components by the, by the eigenvalues, which means that the first principal component, um, so we say explains or captures this fraction of the total variance, right? The next one captures the lambda 2 over this trace um, fraction of the total variance, and together they capture 100% of the explained variance. Um, so that's that that's a metric that allows you to quantify how much how much original variance present in the data, like a high dimensional variance, is captured by each of your principal components. Um, one comment to that example, you may have noticed that these features of the wine data set were very 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 different, right? There was a concentration of something and there was a color of the wine. So maybe the concentration is given in, in, in some units and, and color is given in completely different units and we're talking about the variances here so one of them can have much larger variance than another. So you often have data like that and it almost always makes sense to somehow normalize all the features before you proceed with PCA. So if you have data that has features on different in different units it probably doesn't make sense to do PCA on it just like that. It makes sense to standardize all the features, which means center and then divide by the standard deviation. So after you did this, now every feature has standard deviation equal to one, right? But there's still correlations between them, so you can still do PCA. Um, but now actually you know what's, what is the trace of the covariance matrix, it just equals the dimensionality, right? Because the original variances are all one, but the eigenvalues can be, can be anything. So I will give one example of that. So this is a different, a different data which is performance of, um, of um, several athletes in a, in a competition where they compete uh, 
um, in, in, in several different disciplines, right? So they run 200 meters, run 400 meters, the same, run 800 meters, jump, throw, javelin, the spear, um, and, um, and so on. So my rows are people, athletes, and my columns are the, uh, the, the, the times in seconds, uh, how fast they ran, and also the distance and meters maybe, how, how far they threw something or the height in, in meters probably, um, the height of the, of the jump, and, and so on. So if you take this data as, as they are and do PCA, you get something like that. And look at these biplot lengths. Now I just have two very long lines that are, one is almost exactly horizontal and one is almost exactly vertical. And this is run 800 meters, and this is the length of your spare uh, throw the javelin result. So why does it look like that? Well, it looks like that because these these will be the largest numbers. Okay, you're running 800 meters. It takes time, so the result in probably in seconds, these just will be large numbers. If these are large numbers, then they will also tend to have large variance. Okay, so you have a lot of variance in here, and similar reasoning shows that you have a lot of variance in here compared to all other features. So you just end up with PC1 basically equal to this feature, and PC2 basically equal to that feature, and that's not very informative. Um, you didn't need to do this analysis to see that this has the highest variance. So you get a much more informative picture if you standardize all features and then you do PCA. So another way to see it is that you do PCA on the correlation matrix and not on the covariance matrix. So you do eigen decomposition of the correlation matrix, or alternatively you standardize everything and then do eigen decomposition of the covariance matrix, and then you get something that looks much more meaningful. So now you have all, all features contribute to this and you can see that running eight, 800 meters and running 200 meters are, are correlated. They po point in roughly the same similar dimension, um, right? And, and they seem to be anti-correlated with the jumping results. So some people run faster and some people jump higher. And the throwing, um, the javelin axis is orthogonal to that. So that's the orthogonal axis of variation. So very meaningful, actually, very insightful plot that you get here uh, after you standardize, but not before. Um, the question often comes up if you do this, of how to, to choose how many principal components to look at, right? So, so far I only showed you always two-dimensional plots, but you can in principle make a similar plot for principal component three versus principal component four, and so on. So how many did you choose? So the, 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 the right object here mathematically to think about is the spectrum of the covariance matrix, which is the set of all eigenvalues. So if you plot them sorted, right, you have P eigenvalues that just decrease like that, and then what you want to, to, to focus on are these initial large eigenvalues. And then usually for high dimensional data, you will have this tail of small eigenvalues that also are very similar and just like slowly decrease and so on. So the sum eigenvalues stand out, usually correspond to some interesting modes of variation in the data. And then the rest is, is basically noise that gives you this slowly decreasing tail. So there's a lot of heuristics about how to find the number of interesting eigenvalues here. And these are like, maybe you want to look for the, for the uh, um, like somehow find a place where this decays rapidly and then starts going down slower. So you, ba you find a place like that and say these first four eigenvalues maybe are meaningful to me. So this is called uh, looking for an elbow in this plot. Or you can say, I will, I will, take as many PCs as needed to capture together 90% of the variance, okay? So I'm summing up the eigenvalues, and once I have the 90% of the total sum, I stop. Um, these are all just heuristics. There are more objective methods. Um, I know of two broad families. One can either do cross-validation, or one can use um, shuffling of the features. It, it takes a little bit of time to, to explain how to do cross-validation for PCA, so I will not be explaining this today. I want to explain this uh, shuffling of the features method, though. Um, here is my, in the same toy example, here are my original eigenvalues of my original matrix. So one can do a very, a very useful and a very simple, but nevertheless useful trick, 
one takes this X matrix and shuffles every column independently. So shuffling means I just change the order of the values in column one and in column two but separately from column one and then in column three, in all columns. So what will happen is that the variance of every column is unchanged. I change the order of the values but the variance is the same. So if you think about the covariance matrix, the diagonal values will stay exactly the same as they were. But if you had feature one and feature two correlated, after you shuffle them independently, they are not going to be correlated anymore, right? You killed the correlation. So you will have, but you will not have exact zero correlation because you shuffled, but maybe there's still some correlation left by chance. So you will have, after shuffling, the covariance matrix, which has the same values in the diagonal and smaller random values of diagonal, which will be the larger your sample size, the smaller these values of diagonal will typically be. So you can just shuffle it once and then do the uh, eigen decomposition and plot the eigenvalues. And what will you will typically find is that you will not have any very large values anymore. Because if you had original data, which with very, like, it had a lot of correlations, right? Uh, remember the scatter plot in the in the first slides. If you have correlated data, this gives you this high mode mode of, of large correlation along this diagonal axis. If you didn't have correlation after shuffling, you don't have a lot. Of, you don't have correlations, strong correlations anymore. Then you won't have these large eigenvalues. So you will have smaller. Typically, you will have smaller values here. However, the total sum is the same, right? That's important because the variances of the features, the trace stayed the same, so the sum has to be the same. So if these went down, then these had to go up. So you can do that, you can do this a bunch of times, and then look for the eigenvalues that are above, above what you get by shuffling. In this case, let's say it's three, um, and then I say these are my three significant eigenvalues. They are, in some sense, above the noise that you obtain by, by shuffling the data. So that's a very useful trick, actually useful in other contexts too. Um, next is principal component analysis for pre-processing the data. So, so far I gave you a couple of examples for using PCA for data exploration. Now I al mentioned that one can also use PCA for pre-processing. So I take my data X, I find some um, leading eigenvectors, let's say take K, um, a small number of eigenvectors, put them in matrix V, uh, K, and multiply X by VK, get a smaller matrix uh, with only K features, this over here, and then use this smaller matrix for downstream processing. One can, so you, it's, it, it has, it can have some advantages. So what are the properties of this matrix? It's smaller, right, obviously. Um, it, it takes less space. Um, it has, uh, if you use it in some regression problem, you have less coefficients to fit. It has low dimensionality, smaller size. Also, all correlations are zero, right? By cons we discussed this before. So all these features will be uncorrelated. If you kick out all the small eigenvalues, then the result will not have small eigenvalues anymore. And remember, in uh, lectures on regression, we talked a lot about how small eigenvalues cause problems, uh, sorry, cause uh, large uncertainties, um, standard errors, and um, estimation problems for your, for your regression, in, in the regression setting. So it's, it's often a good idea to, to get rid of small singular values um, or eigenvalues. Of course, you can also just say that you use all eigenvectors, which means you rotated the data, then it has the same size and the same number of features. Now, they still all features have correlation zero, but all the small eigenvalues are still present there, and you just rotated the data. So usually, this will not achieve anything. You only get something different if you, if you rotate the data to the eigenvector basis and then kick out uh, small um, principal components with very small variances. It turns out that if you use this for regression, then actually this is very closely related to rich regression. So I think this is actually an under or often underappreciated fact. I would like to stress this here. So uh, let's discuss the relationship between the rich regression 
and this procedure where you take X matrix to the PCA, keep only leading principal components, and then use that to predict some Y. So this even has a name, it's called a principal component regression, PCR. So let's discuss the relationship between PCR and the ridge regression. Um, so I will, I will only talk about that very briefly. And as a reminder, here is, so if you have the matrix X and the matrix Y, then the uh, ordinary least squares solution beta hat is given by X transpose X inverse X transpose Y. And your predicted values that I called Y hat, you need to multiply X by this beta hat, so you get this. And if you plug here the singular value decomposition of X, then it simplifies a lot, and you just get this. So U, U transpose Y, where U are the left singular values of X. So this is standard regression, right? This is just written like that, but no regularization. Now, we talked in the lecture on ridge regression about what happens if you add the ridge penalty. And it turns out that if you add the ridge penalty, you add a term here within inside the inverse, right? And then if you rewrite everything in terms of singular vectors and values, then what happens here is that between this U and U transpose, you get this diagonal matrix with singular values, and this guy here in the denominator. So if lambda is very small, this doesn't do anything, but if the lambda is large, then it will penalize uh, the large, no, the small singular values. So the small singular values will get, um, will get to zero here, with the help of lambda, and the, but the large ones, the ones that are much larger than lambda, basically won't change much. So the ridge regression, this, this is just a recap of what I said in lecture four. What ridge regression does, it affects, it shrinks the, in some sense, the small singular, like the, it shrinks the directions in which the original data had very little, had, 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 had little variance. So the the directions corresponding to small singular values. In principal component regression, it's very similar thing, but it's like a hard thresholding of singular values. We say, here are my singular values. I will just take the first 10 and kick out the rest. So I'm using, you can think about that as using a diagonal matrix that has one, 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 10 times, and then the rest is just zero. That's my diagonal matrix. I plug it in here instead of this, and this will be solution to the PCR. Uh, regression problem. So as you see, this is something that has decreasing values on the diagonal, and this is something that has decreasing values on the diagonal. This just does the hard thresholding of singular values, and this is, you can, you can say that this does soft thresholding of singular values. Um, but it's very similar, right? It's, it's similar in, in spirit and qualitatively, and this parameter k um, s can serve as a regularization parameter. Um, so if you take larger k, you regularize less, right? So you, you, you have larger bias and less variance. And um, sorry, you regularize less means you have smaller bias and higher variance, of course. And if you increase the regularization strength, which means you decrease the number of PCs that you keep, then your variance will go down, but your bias will go up. So you have the bias variance threshold, the same thing depending on k. Usually, in practice, you're better off just using a ridge regression and not thinking about that, but um, I think conceptually it helps a lot to have this mental picture of, um, of uh, ridge regression doing something qualitatively similar to just kicking out small PCs in the in the data, which will which doesn't guarantee which is not guaranteed to always work. Right? You can have a situation where the smallest principal component is actually the one that predicts your your Y, your response. So you have a lot of high variance noise in the data, and then there is this this very small. S um, there is a component, there is some direction in the data that has very small variance, but that is the direction that can predict the response. You can, th this, is, this is possible. You can construct a situation like that. And in that case, PCR will fail, and ridge regression will also fail. Um, and if you don't have enough data 
uh, your sample size is low, so low that you can't use the ordinary least squares because because of all the uh, because of the high variance problems and overfitting, and you don't have an a priori knowledge that this is the direction you should be looking for, then you're just doomed and you will not be able to to extract this um, regression coefficients reliably. So in a sense, all this ridge regression, principal component regression, and so on, is is has an implicit assumption that um, that it's the large variance directions that are meaningful. Or to say it another way, it's the assumption that the regression coefficients should be small, right? That's how ridge regression operates, and and this is just an assumption. It often it often works, but it doesn't have to work. Okay, last thing that I want to cover today. Uh, briefly, and then we're done, is called probabilistic PCA, which is another perspective on principal component analysis. Um, and I want to mention it because it's a very useful perspective. It's something that um, that will that is related to many other things in in more advanced statistics and in machine learning and if you keep studying it you will you will encounter this uh, all these topics um, so I want to like, mention it now so that you have uh, that you have a correct perspective on that okay so PPCA probabilistic PCA what 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 is that and um, I will I will introduce the problem and at first it will have nothing to do with PCA but stay with me um, and you will see where I'm going. So we are considering here a, la a probabilistic model, a latent variable model. Okay, and I'm setting up my latent variable model as follows. I have There are latent variables, Z. We're not observing Z. They are latent. And they are just coming from a spherical Gaussian in K dimensions. Okay, so they have all mean zero and they have um, the covariance matrix is identity matrix in k dimensions. So this is this is my s my hidden hidden variables. And then there are vectors that we actually observe the x's. And given the z, the x is coming from another Gaussian distribution that has the mean given like that, right? So I'm taking my z and I'm linearly transforming it with some w maybe adding some mean vector and that's the mean of my x now conditioned on z and then there is some noise in addition so what does that mean it means that i have some some hidden variables let's say in two dimensions so then you can think about two dimensions and a gaussian in two dimensions this gets somehow mapped with the w so i multiply it by some random matrix w and maybe move somewhere and this can now live in 10 dimensions and for each particular z, right, I have some z value. It gets mapped some to some ten-dimensional value there, and then I have a different Gaussian here centered around that value, and that's where the x coming from from this distribution. It's like a two-stage hierarchical uh, hierarchical latent variable model that where you first draw z from here, then you map it like that, use that as a mean to draw another random vector and this is something that you actually observe so if you have the vector the vac the sorry matrix x where you put all your data right the rows of this matrix are coming from from this distribution uh, but each row corresponds to some value of the hidden variable z okay so that's um, that's my um, latent variable model one can see that the the mean of the entire x um, is, is actually just given by mu because this has mean zero, so this has mean zero, so there is just mu left. So that's easy. It's pretty easy to see that the covariance matrix of x is basically given by, by this w. So w directly specifies you the covariance matrix plus uh, also sigma squared on the diagonal. Doesn't matter that much for now. The task here would be you I give you the some data, so the matrix x. And you want to find the mu, the w, and the sigma squared um, that, uh, like, under the maximum likelihood principle, right? So you want to find the parameters of this model that give you the maximum probability to observe this matrix X. And notice that this is a latent variable model, and we want the maximum likelihood um, solution of this latent variable model. And I'm mentioning that 
because just last week we talked about a lot about Gaussian mixture models and I said that whenever you have a latent variable probabilistic model, you can use expectation maximization to fit it. And this can be applied to this um, latent variable model, which is not discrete anymore as it was there, but everything is continuous here. And you can use, nevertheless, you can use EM, expectation maximization algorithm, to fit it. And it's actually very natural, also very, very simple to, to formulate here. So you have the E step and the M step, like in the previous lecture. And in the expectation step, given some fixed values of W, mu, and sigma squared, you find the posterior distribution over Zs, over these latent variables. And then in the M step, given these Zs, you hold that's fixed and the x fixed and you just find the parameters the w mu and sigma that maximize the likelihood given the x and given the z's okay and and then with some work one can work out the update formulas um for for both e step and m step it's actually not that difficult but i don't have time for that um today the I hope just, the, so I, I just want to convey the general principle that you can do in principle this as an E-step and this an app step then you iterate and you converge. And thanks to the, to the uh, expectation maximization theory, you will maximize, you will, you will reach um, a maximum, at least local. In this case, um, you will also reach the global maximum. But the nice thing is that you can prove, and I will not prove that either, but one can prove, that this solution that you will get, so the maximum likelihood W, is actually um, basically the PCA solution. So the W hat, the maximum likelihood estimate of this W matrix, consists of leading eigenvectors um, scaled in a particular way, but the directions of the W columns are just the eigenvectors. So if you, if you assume two-dimensional latent variable model, then you will get two leading eigenvectors as the columns of the W which means you basically are doing PCA, right? That's why it's called probabilistic PCA. So this shows that you can give a probabilistic interpretation to the, sum to, to the method that PCA that didn't look probabilistic at all um, at first, uh, during the first hour of this lecture, but one can view it through this lens. And the, I mean, it's a little bit different, there's the, the, the scaling and so on. There's a lot to discuss about principle, about P, PCA here, but I think the important thing is that it's actually nearly equivalent um, to PCA. You just get the same, the subspace that you get is identical, meaning if you're looking for the two-dimensional latent variable, you will, you will find the same two-dimensional subspace uh, of your data as the, as the PCA does. That's actually a pretty, pretty remarkable result. And on this last slide, I will mention that you can make this latent variable model more complicated in various ways, and by making it more complicated, you obtain actually useful existing um, latent variable models that are used in, 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 in different fields. And I will just mention one example, which is this stays the same, this stays the same. The only thing that changes, I had previously sigma squared times identity matrix, and now I'm putting this matrix psi, which is a diagonal matrix, but arbitrary diagonal matrix. So it has, if this is a 10-dimensional vector, then this has 10 diagonal values, and I treat these 10 values as the parameters of my model, okay? So I don't only want to fit W and mu, now I want to fit these 10 um, variances in the, in the Psi matrix. And this is called factor analysis. So some of you may have heard about that. It's a, it's a model very popular in some, in some social sciences. sciences. Um, where you also have some high dimensional data and you want to find factors, like hidden latent factors in the data, that's how it's called there. So you're doing factor analysis for that. And in fact, this is very, very related to doing PCA or sp to, to doing at least probabilistic uh, PCA because this is a probabilistic latent variable model that is, that is slightly more general uh, than probabilistic principal component analysis. And there are different other ways to, to generalize that. Um, and then you get the whole field of machine learning that and statistics uh, that deals with latent variable models. With this, uh, I finish this lecture. Thank you. <laughs>